Paint them yellow to make them easy to see. We outfit them with flashing lights and mechanical signs to draw attention to their movements. And we enact traffic laws making it illegal to pass them when stopped. Their cargo is our children, and safety is our primary concern. Above all else, we want to be free from worry when our children are on a school bus, and we look for ways to protect them. But not every danger can be seen. Chemical toxins in the air children breathe, the surfaces they touch, and the food and water they eat and drink are affecting them in ways we are just now discovering. Concerns about the rising rates of asthma, neurobehavioral problems, cancer, and other environmentally mediated illnesses in children have prompted scientists to look more closely at the toxins to which children are regularly exposed. And the exhaust from school buses and other vehicles is one of the primary targets of investigation. Well, it's interesting to think about what diesel exhaust actually is. It's a complex mixture of many, many chemicals, and it's also composed of soot, the black stuff that you see coming out of diesel exhaust pipes. So what you have is a mixture of particles that are coated with lots of different chemicals. Many of them are known to be carcinogens without question, and in fact, diesel exhaust is classified as a known cause of lung cancer in people. The pattern of exposures to diesel exhaust on school buses varies with engine age and condition, window configuration, temperature and humidity factors, as well as traffic conditions. But one other factor seems to be especially significant. Idling school buses, lined up one behind the other as children load, can quickly fill with a mixture of chemicals including known human carcinogens, as well as chemicals that can exacerbate or even cause asthma. Most of the emphasis in research had been on treatment and prevention had been neglected, partly because we didn't have very sharp tools to look at the interactions between air pollutants and allergen exposures and how the co-exposure to these pollutants might increase risk of allergic sensitization and eventually of asthma. Diesel exhaust in many asthmatics will be one of a number of things that will increase both the severity and the frequency of asthma attacks. And of course if there's idling going on uh, while they're loading, the entire area, that micro environment around the school becomes contaminated with diesel exhaust that then lots of children are breathing and which is infiltrating into the buses and so they're riding home with it as well. Not one minute idling, not five minute idling, not 10 second idling, no idling. No idling is the only policy that as a superintendent that I can recommend because no idling is the only policy that I know will protect the students to the best of my ability. We have to find every way that we can to not pollute the environment and uh, we have an obligation on a broad scope basis to use every precautionary measure that we can use that makes good sense for people. New technologies in fuel formulation and engine design will eventually help reduce the toxins in diesel exhaust. But change will take time and cost money. In the meantime, children will continue to be at risk. We accumulate the evidence and we look at that and we say, what pattern is beginning to emerge here? What picture is emerging here? And at some point, we take that weight of evidence and we ask ourselves, is it sufficient to act? Are there alternative ways of accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish so that we get away from this thing of concern, whatever it happens to be in the environment? Is there an alternative? Many states and local municipalities have regulations limiting the idling of motor vehicles, but ordinances which restrict the idling to certain time limits are extremely difficult to monitor and enforce and are largely ineffective at protecting children's health. My sense is that we're living in a world that is essentially new and different than uh, any world that humans have ever experienced before. So we need a new ethical framework for thinking about uh, how we react to human activities in the world now because the consequences are so profound, not only for the current generation, but for future generations. It seems to me that we have to, each of us, say, what are the things that we can do to help our students, help our community, and show that we're leaders? No idling has no cost and all positive results. 
So from my standpoint, it's a win-win for everybody and it's something that school districts ought to be doing and it was a privilege to be able to be the first one to do that.